Open your Bibles to Luke 6, 37. In Luke 6, 37, Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount. He is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And this is the latter part of it, okay? And in verse 37, he mentions some things that they are not to do and some things that they are to do and then the results of that. In other words, here's a cause, here's an effect. Here's a cause, here's the result of what you did, okay? So look what he says in verse 37. Judge not and you shall not be judged. That's a wonderful thing, amen. You know what he's saying? If, if you'll not be judgmental toward other people, chances are other people won't be judgmental toward you. That's a good thing, amen. And, and then he said, uh, condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. And by the way, have you ever noticed that it's a whole lot easier to find something to condemn somebody for than it is to commend them for? But wouldn't it be a wonderful life if rather than looking for something to condemn people for, that we would always be looking for something to commend them for? Just think about it, you know. Uh, if the wife was looking real hard to find her husband doing something well that she could commend him for. Amen. Now, that'll be difficult for some of you wives, but that'd be a good thing, okay? And uh, the, the husband would always be looking for something good to commend his wife for. And by the way, if your wife is cooking for you and you don't commend her occasionally, you'll probably be eating TV dinners for a long time, amen? <laughs> But wouldn't it be a wonderful life if rather than looking for something to condemn people for, that we were always looking for something to commend them for? And, and that would be good for parents and their children. You know, and, and I know we have to correct our children, but if we're not careful, uh, we'll be more apt to condemn our children than we are to commend them. That'll work in the church. That'll work in the workplace. Uh, that'll work anywhere. You know how it would work? It's the words of the Lord. So he said, uh, don't be judgmental and people not be judgmental toward you. He said, uh, uh, don't condemn and others will probably not condemn you. And, and then he says, forgive and you shall be forgiven. And uh, I'm sure that every one of us here tonight uh, probably stand in need of somebody forgiving us. And if you want other people to forgive you, then probably one of the best things you can do is to check your mind, check your heart, and see if there's something or somebody that you have not forgiven, and then forgive that person. And you say, well, I would if they ever asked me to. Hey, you don't forgive them because they ask you to. You don't forgive them just for their sake. You forgive them for your sake, amen? I mean, don't hold grudges and so forth. So here's a cause and effect, a cause and effect, a cause and effect. Now, here's our text tonight. Verse 38. Give, there's something Jesus said do. Like he said, don't be judgmental. Like he said, uh, don't, don't condemn. Like he said, forgive. In verse 38, he says, give. Give, okay. What's the result of giving? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So I've got a very difficult subject tonight. It'll be hard for you to write it down if you keep notes. I'll tell you how to spell it, okay? G I V E. That's the subject, give. I, I don't know how many times I may have quoted this verse in sermons, Brother Chapel. I have no idea. And I, I'm sure hundreds, maybe thousands of times. 
But a few months ago, as I was just reading through the Bible, and, and I, I read this verse, and I read it over and over and over again, and I, all I could think of was, wow, that deserves more than just quoting. I mean, it is filled with great truths. Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. And in reality, it's an agricultural term, okay? And many of the illustrations in the Bible came from agriculture. It's like a, a man would, a, a farmer would have a bushel basket and he would want everybody that he sold something to to get everything that they deserve and even a little bit more. And so he said, you know, give and it shall be given to you, good measure. In other words, Fill it all the way to the top. Then you take your hands and you push it down. And then you shake it together. And then you fill it up again to where it's running over. So here, here's a farmer and he wants whoever he is selling something to to get everything that they deserve and a little bit more. Some of you older people will remember this term, a baker's dozen. You go to the baker and you get a dozen donuts, and guess what? They'd throw in an extra one. You'd get 13. That was what they called a baker's dozen. I think now when you go to the baker and get a dozen donuts, they probably put in 11, okay? <laughs> it's a different generation, okay? But they're saying, hey, we, we want everybody to be sure that they get everything they, they deserve and even more. And, and so that's what Jesus is saying. Give. That's what we're supposed to do. And it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down, shaking together and running over. Shall men give in your bosom. For the same measure you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. In our English Bible, the word give is found 811 times. God must have liked the word give, amen? I mean, is there some form of give? Give, given, gave, so on and so forth. 811 times. Now, to be sure, most of the time when it is used, it is talking about what God has given us. In fact, the bottom line is, everything that we have is a gift from God. In the book of James, we find the words, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light, with whom there is no barefootedness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, he's saying to us, everything we have Everything we have is a gift from God. And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, Brother says, you've been a preacher all your life. Everything you have comes from God, but I work for my money. And who gives you the breath to breathe? And who gives you the strength to work? And who puts you in a place where you ha can have a job and you can work? Hey, it, it's very simple. And it, it's not just found in this passage. It is found time after time after time that everything we have is a gift from God. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, the apostle Paul asked two rhetorical questions, questions that have an obvious answer. The first question is this, who maketh thee to differ from another? That's pretty obvious. It is God. By the way, God made you, amen? amen? He said to Jeremiah, and he's saying to you and I, before I formed thee in the belly, in other words, I made you, I made you, who maketh thee to differ from another? And are we not thrilled to death tonight that God has made all of us different? Wouldn't it be a, a sad-looking world if Everybody in the world looked just alike. Imagine 7.6 billion people looking like Don says. Would that be a sad world or not? 
and you laugh. But it'd be a whole lot sadder if all of them looked like you, amen. <laughs> God, God made us all different. It's God that made us different. And then the next question is, what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Huh? And it's the same answer. Nothing. Everything I have, I received from God. And then he said, then since you've received it, why, why boast about it? In other words, in reality, we don't have anything to boast about ourselves. Thank God our glory is in the Christ, cross of Christ. Amen. Give and it shall be given unto you. And I look at a verse like this and I think about the author of that statement. It is God. Sovereign, omnipotent, self-existing, God. Think about it, God. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were formed by the word of God. Think about that. The God that we're talking about formed the world, not just this little bitty speck called earth, but the entire universe. Colossians 1 tell us that it was created by him and for him. In other words, he created the entire universe. It all belongs to him. You say, Brother says. Evidently, you flunked biology. You don't believe in the Big Bang Theory? And I do. Hebrews 11, 3. God spoke, and bang, there it was, amen. <laughs> and that's exactly what it says. <laughs> now, here's the question. Why would a sovereign God of the universe that created the entire universe, and by the way, he still controls it. It all belongs to him. And by the way, this book was written to me, and it was written to you. Now, what in the world would a God that created the entire universe want me to give to him? And in the Bible, there are three things that I am absolutely positive that God wants every one of us to give to him. Now, he said here, whatever you give to me, I'm going to give you something a whole lot better. And in 2 Timothy 1, 12, the apostle Paul made this statement. I'm not ashamed. Now, he had talked about being persecuted, all the trials and everything, he said. But then he said, but I'm not ashamed. I'm not disappointed. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Now, there's several words that are, have very similar to me. Give, commit, present yield, and so forth. So listen to Paul. I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded, I am convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. Now mark it down. Anything I commit to God, I can cease worrying about that because God will take good care of it. He'll keep it. Now, the opposite is true. Anything I refuse to commit to God, I had better worry about it because I'm going to mess it up. Okay? It's that simple. Now, in Luke 6, he tells us, whatever we give to him, then he's going to give us something a whole lot better. So, number one, I am sure, I am absolutely positive, I'm just not 
dogmatic, I am bulldogmatic about this, that he wants every one of us and the 7.6 billion people of the world to give their souls to him. In other words, to commit their soul to him, to yield their soul to him. See, how do you know that, Brother says? The Bible says, it is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says he is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. In other words, when Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died on Calvary, he made it possible for every man, woman, boy, and girl who had ever lived or would ever live to be saved through his blood. So what happens when I commit my soul to the Lord? When I yield to him, when I give myself my soul to him? Now, again, October is a good month for me because that's the month I got saved in. 69 years ago. I was 15 years old, 16 years old. You say, okay, we figured it out. You're 85 years old. Good math. And I know what some of you are thinking. Brother says, you can't be 85 years old. You must be 105, okay? <laughs> 69 years ago. And, and really, all anybody did, they didn't give me a gospel tract. They didn't give me the gospel. All Bill Welch did was invite me to go to a Youth for Christ meeting. And I went that Saturday night, and I got saved. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was on my way to hell. And I went there for that night for the purpose to get saved. And all I wanted is for the preacher to quit preaching so I could go forward and do that. And eventually, like all preachers, he finally did. <laughs> and I went forward and there was a Baptist preacher there, Gifford Berry. And he took the Bible, God's word, and he begins to show me all of sin. And I knew I was a sinner. If I died in my sin, I'd go to hell. And can't save yourself. I knew that. I'd try. But the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that Saturday night, 69 years ago, I committed my soul to the Lord. Amen. Okay, what did he do for you? <laughs> now, I didn't know all this then, okay? What did he do for you? Number one, he gave me eternal life. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gives me them is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He gave me eternal life. He forgave all of my sins. He put them behind him. He cast them in the sea of forgetfulness. He'll never hold them against, them against me again forever. He gave me peace in my heart. He gave me a new life. He gave me hope. Wow, I could go on and on and on. And when you give your soul to the Lord, he says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give in your bosom. I'll never forget an elderly man came up to me that Saturday night. And uh, this is what he said. And he knew my background. He knew the family I was from. He knew the town I was from and all those things and so forth. He came up to me and he said, boy, if you can just keep what you got tonight, you'll be all right. In other words, he didn't expect anything of me. Just keep what you got tonight. And I didn't know if I was going to keep it or not. But later on, thank God, I learned I didn't have to keep it. Somebody else was keeping it for me. It's the one that saved me. Amen. But you know, if we're not careful... We get the idea that being saved and salvation is a ticket to heaven and an escape from hell, and that's all it is. And thank God it is a ticket to heaven and it is an escape from hell, amen? 
because there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Okay. So it's that, but that's not all of it. The first verse I ever memorized in the Bible was Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. After I got saved, I went forward in a Baptist church to join the church, to be baptized. And Brother Ratliff took me down to a little room and he wanted to explain to me again about salvation to be sure I was saved. And we went through that again and so forth. And then he gave me a little New Testament and he underlined Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And he said, now, Don, when you come tomorrow night, I want you to have memorized those two verses. And I did. I went home that night. I read them over and over and over again. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And uh, so the next night when I went to church, Brother Ratley said, okay, Don, can you quote the verses? And I said, I sure can. And I did. And they've always meant so much to me. You know, salvation, it's all of him, amen. For by grace are you saved through faith. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We didn't work for it. All we did was receive it. But you know, if you read your Bible, the way it was written, not by verses, but by paragraphs, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is not the end of the paragraph. The next verse is part of the paragraph, and it says... For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. In other words, salvation is not just a ticket to heaven and an escape from hell. It is the beginning of a wonderful journey. And so I can be sure that God not only wants me to give him myself, my soul, but he wants me to give him all of me. All of me. Here's the verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Notice the word present, give, give. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, Paul is saying, because you have been saved by the grace of God, because of his mercy, then you ought to give your all to the Lord. In other words, I believe that every believer, not just a few believers, no, no. I believe that every believer, somewhere along the line, ought to come to the place where we could say, dear Lord, I do not belong to myself. By the way, you don't. You're not your own. You're bought with the price. That price was the precious blood of Christ. I don't belong to myself. I'll be willing to go anywhere you want me to go. And by the way, I'm convinced if we all would be able to say that tonight, there would be a lot more people going to the great unevangelized fields of the world. like the Congo, where the man said, Nani, Jesus. I'll be willing to go anywhere you want me to go. I'll be willing to do anything you want me to do. I'll be willing to be anything you want me to be. I'll be willing to give anything you want me to give. That's commitment. Committing our all to the Lord. That's what God wants. The Corinthian Christians, Paul said, they first gave their selves to the Lord. And that's the most important thing in all the world for a born-again believer. Now, I know what the devil's saying, okay? I know what the devil's saying. I know what he said to me, and I know what he's saying to you tonight. Wait a minute. If I told God I'd go anywhere he wanted me to go and do anything he wanted me to do, and be anything you want me to be, and give anything you want me to give, he'd make me do something that would make me miserable the rest of my life. Now, remember, the devil is a liar. He's the father of lies, amen? And we cannot believe him. Wait a minute. If we have that kind of an attitude toward God, something is bad wrong with us. After all, God is our heavenly father, and the bottom line is, 
when we are obedient to him, he will give us his very best. God reserves the best for those who leave the choice to him. I've told most of you, but you've heard everything I've said hundreds of times anyway. So. My friend, Ron Bishop, used to be the basketball coach and, and uh, athletic director at Tennessee Temple University. And I've heard Ron give his testimony. He got saved when he was 15 years old, and soon after he got saved, he, he went to Christian camps, sort of like me, okay? He went to Christian camp. He said, when I got to Christian camp, there were college students that were counselors, young men, young ladies, and they would be like 19, 20, 21 years old. Ron was 15 years old. And he said, I got a crush on one of those college girls. He said, man, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. And I look at her and I think she is the most beautiful. She is the sweetest thing I've ever seen in my life. And he said, I heard missionaries giving testimonies. I told God I'd go anywhere but Africa, and God sent me to Africa. <laughs> I told God I would go anywhere but China, and God sent me to China. And he said, I listened to those testimonies, and I began to pray, Dear Lord, don't make me marry that girl <laughs> and go to Hawaii as a missionary. <laughs> And he said, sure enough, he didn't do either one. <laughs> I've been to 80 different countries around the world. I've seen missionaries. And I, I, I've often thought God knows exactly who to send work. I mean... I, I think of the Drydens down in Haiti. They've been there something like 45 years. You couldn't blow them out of Haiti with a stick of dynamite. Most people couldn't wait to get out of Haiti once they get there. I was with Rick and Bark, Be Becky the other day in the Philippines, and I watched them. You could not get them to leave the Philippines for anything. God knows who to put where. You see, God knows more about you than you know about yourself. And when you commit yourself totally to him, then he's going to give his very best for you. I can't imagine what my life would have been like if I would have decided when I was a young person, I'm going to take care of Don Sisk rather than saying, I'm going to commit my life to the Lord. It, it's amazing what God does. Uh, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, press it down, shake it together, and running over shall men give in your bosom. And God's saying to us tonight, hey, whatever you give to me, I'm going to give you something a whole lot better than that. I'm sure God wants me to give him my soul. I'm sure God wants me to give him my Self. Now, I don't have to worry about my soul. I know I'm saved, going to heaven. I don't have to worry about Don Sisk. Everybody else does. You know, you ought to slow down. You ought to quit doing this. You ought to quit going there. You know, on and on and on. Uh, Brother Kerry Smith was interviewing me not long ago, Pastor. And he said, okay, Brother Sisk, what about the future? And I said, Kerry, I don't even buy green bananas. Amen. I don't know about the future. <laughs> I don't, I don't have any ideas what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next, but, but it doesn't make any difference. You see, what's important is that tonight I'm where God wants me to be. And then whatever God wants me to do tomorrow, or if I live that long, okay, that's okay. You see, anything we commit to him, we don't have to worry about it. Then I'm positive that God wants me to give him my substance. Now, think about that. The God that created the entire universe wants me to give him my substance because he needs my money. Are you kidding? 
Huh? No. He wants me to give him my substance so that he can give me what he wants to give me. And, and, and I've often thought, what God puts in our hand is just a test. And if, if we'll be good stewards of that, then God will put more and more and more. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So I am positive that, uh, that God wants me to commit, give, yield, at least 10% of everything that he gives me back to him. Why? Because he needs it? No, no, no. No. He owns the entire universe. But he has a plan. And his plan for the church is that all believers give at least 10% of their income to the local church. And by the way, that is a wonderful plan. Thank God we don't have to have rummage sales. We don't have to have all the other junk. Why? God's plan is God's people take care of the local church. And then he said, bring you all the tithes in the storehouse and see if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you'll not be able to receive. <laughs> in other words, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. Give. And then I'm sure that God wants me to give something to missions every week. I learned this 50 years ago. One of my favorite passages, the whole Bible, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. And the context is you're giving to missions. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. You have seen the presentations. You have heard the testimony. You have heard the preaching. Surely God has dealt with our heart. And the Bible says, every man, according as he purposeth in his heart. Don't just give what you can figure out from your head, but let God speak to your heart and I believe from the depth of my heart, if we did, we'd be giving a whole lot more so nobody could say, not a Jesus. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. I'm sure that God wants us to give so the rest of the world can hear the gospel. Now, I don't get to come to church very often. Pastor mentioned the other day they might have to church me, okay? But I assured him every month I send my tithe in, okay? And I'll tell you, one of, one of the joys, Brother Chapel, is to write the check for the tithe and to know that I am having a part and everything that Lancaster Baptist Church does and Lancaster Baptist Church has made a great impact on this Antelope Valley and I've had a part in it. Amen. See, that's the joy. That's what the tithe does. And then the 225 missionaries, and I guess we're going to take on 20 more or something like that, whatever, okay? And so we'll have about 250 missionaries. And guess what? When I write out my faith promise commitment, and I get put it in that envelope like I'm going to do tonight for this month, okay? And then what I, is, is the joy in my heart is that I'm going to have a part in every missionary that's supported by Lancaster Baptist Church. And that is big. Think about it. When you go to bed tonight, somebody will get up somewhere and start preaching on your behalf. Amen. The sun never goes down on the ministry of a real missionary church. I cannot even possibly think of a better way to invest than to invest in the ministry of the local church and then to invest in the ministry of a missions program like Lancaster Baptist Church. I'm positive God wants me to give him my soul, and I'm sure glad I did. 
And I'm positive, and by the way, you don't have to be much, okay? I, I remember when Brother Chapel and Brother Smith started thinking about writing a biography of me, and I, I kept telling them there's nothing to write about. And they kept on, kept on. Finally, I said, okay, if you can write a biography that shows what God can do with nothing, go ahead and do it. And by the way, they did it. Kerry's a great author. He didn't have much of a subject, but it's a great book. You ought to read it, Amen. <laughs> It'll tell you what God can do with nothing. I think of the little boy that just had five barley loaves and two fishes. But what are they amongst them in? All God needs is all you have. All God needs is all you have. So there it is, okay? Give, it shall be given to you. Good measure. Press it down, shake it together, running over. Show me and give in your bosom. Now I want you to look for just a minute at the last part of that verse. For the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And you know what he's saying? You just determine how much you want. Wow. <laughs> huh? Yeah. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You just determine how much you want. Our first Christmas, I'll never forget, 1956, after I began pastoring. And a lady came to Virginia and myself in the Johnson Island Baptist Church down in Kentucky. And she said, Brother Don, I want you and Miss Virginia to go to Jordan Furniture Company. I have an account there. Some of you old people remember before credit cards, we had accounts, account at the grocery store, account at the service station, you know, account at different places. Okay. She said, I have an account there. And two of our members, Buford and Ruby Day, they work there. And she says, you, you and, you and Miss Virginia go do it there. And you buy whatever you want and whatever you need. And that will be my Christmas present for you all. And I said, okay, Ms. Lynn, about how much should we spend? Doesn't make any difference, Brother Don. Just go ahead and buy whatever you need, whatever you want. Well, that was very dangerous. 1956, we were in Bible school. We needed everything we saw. I mean, we had practically nothing, you know. And we looked at bedroom suits, and I thought, man, that would be better than that old lumpy mattress we've got. We looked at living room suits, and I thought that would be better than that couch. We're afraid somebody to sit on it. One of the springs are going to come up and hit somebody, you know. <laughs> we looked at refrigerators, and I thought that would be better than our ice box. Uh, okay, young people, an ice box <laughs> is a box you put ice in. And as long as the ice lasts, you've got refrigeration. When the re ice is gone, the refrigeration is gone. We had an ice box out on the back porch. You know. We looked at the carpet, and I thought, ooh, it would be nice to get out of bed and put your feet on that carpet rather than that cold linoleum floor. And we shopped for about an hour and a half, talked to Buford and Ruby. And when we left Jordan Furniture Company that, that afternoon, we were carrying our purchase. It was a magazine rack about that long. It cost $5.95. It's still over somewhere in Japan. It is a trophy. We've kept it all these years. It is a trophy of my stupidity. <laughs> We could have had anything in the furniture store. And we settled for a $5.95 magazine, right? And every time I think about that, by the way, that was an embarrassment to Mrs. Lynn. She would have been much more pleased with a much larger gift. And every time I look at that magazine, right, I think, you don't have to be a $5.95 Christian. You don't have to be a $5.95 missionary. You don't have to be a $5.95 preacher. You don't have to be a $5.95 church. 
We have the unlimited resources of Almighty God. Amen. Psalms 81.10 is one of my favorite verses. Listen to it. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And in the Old Testament, when God wanted to show what he could do, he would tell about bringing those two million Israelites out of the Egyptian bondage through the Red Sea on dry land and then drowning Pharaoh and his army when they tried to come over. That was a great feat, amen. So he said, I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Now listen to the last part. Open thy mouth wide and I'll fill it. Open thy mouth wide and I'll fill it. Children, and those were beautiful children tonight, were they not? Don't, don't. Young people, missionaries, and I, I, I envy missionaries. I know a lot of people feel sorry for missionaries. And I often tell people, don't ever feel sorry for missionaries. Don't, don't give missionaries your pity. They, they don't need that. Give them your money. They need that, okay? <laughs> but don't ever pity a missionary. They are right where God wants them to be, doing what God wants them to do. And all those young people, think about it. Don't sell yourself short, children. Teenagers, don't sell yourself short. Young people, don't sell yourself short. Young married couples, don't sell yourself short. Don't shortchange yourself and God. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. So listen to it again. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down, shaking together and running over. Shall man give into your bosom. For the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, I've had people say to me, Brother says, do you give to get? And I'm going to shock you. Yes. Is that the main purpose? No. I give because I love the Lord. And I think what he's done for me then anything I could give would be absolutely nothing in comparison to what he's doing. But I've read the Bible enough times and I've experienced it enough times that I know something that when I give, God is going to give much more back to me. So you say, do you give to get? Yeah. So you can just keep it? No, no. I give to get so I can give more. And in reality, that's the only purpose for money anyway, is to be used for the glory of God. Be sure you've given your soul to the Lord. When you do, you don't have to worry about it. Be sure you've given yourself to the Lord. When you do, you don't have to worry about it. And be sure that God has your substance. Because that money is just a test of what you're going to do with it. And what you do with it will depend on what he can give back to you.